Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's panel's discussion about the Regional Economic Outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa, released by the International Monetary Fund last month. My name is Deborah Carey, and I am the Program Assistant in the Director's Office for the Wilson Center Africa Program. I know we have a number of people following on our webcast and on Twitter, and we welcome you all as well. To those of you joining us via Twitter, you can follow the live tweets of today's event by following the Africa Program's Twitter account, at Africa Up Close, all one word, and you can contribute to the discussion using the hashtags IMF Africa or, IMF Eco or, or Africa Economic Outlook, all one word. I would also like to take this time to acknowledge the distinguished, distinguished members of the African and International Diplomatic Corps, government representatives, media, and members of the Africa Program Advisory Council who are joining us today. I will briefly introduce our presenter and panel for today's event before, turn, before turning it over to Dr. Whitney Schneidman. Dr. Schneidman is the Senior Advisor for Africa at Covington and Burling LLP, as well as an Africa Program Advisory Council member, and he will moderate today's discussion. Mr. Abebe Emro Selassie will present the Economic Outlook Report today. Mr. Selassie is the, is the Director of the African Department at the International Monetary Fund. He has had a long career at the IMF in various capacities and departments, including leading the work on the Regional Economic Outlook for Africa, which we will discuss today. Before the fund, he worked with the Eco Economist Intelligence Unit and then the government of Ethiopia as principal economist in the office of the president. Dr. Brahima Kulibali has joined us today as a discussant for the report. Dr. Kulibali is a senior fellow in global economy and development at the Brookings Institution, as well as the director of the Africa Growth Initiative. Previous to these roles, he was chief economist of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, as well as a professor of economics and international finance. With that, let me welcome Dr. Schneidman to the podium to open the discussion. Great, thank you, Deborah, and uh, thanks to you all uh, for being here. Uh, before we get going, just let me give a shout out to, uh, to our leader, Dr. Uh, Monde Muyangwa, who's sitting in the back. Uh, Monde, thank you for your leadership, and thank you for uh, the invitation to be here and pulling this panel together. Um, I think this will be a really interesting conversation today. I've confessed that I've read the whole report <laughs> and uh, actually found it really interesting. In, and, and we're just talking before. The report got a very interesting um, review in The Economist and sort of said it's really about recovery, you know, and that's taking place in Africa. But I th sort of think that's a simplistic uh, description of the report, because really what I see it is, it's a report about the dynamic change that's taking place on the continent. And I'm just reminded of how many sort of waves of change we've seen. I, I remember when we started working on the African Growth and Opportunity Act in 1995, some 23 years ago, there was negative growth ac across the continent. And then through the period of 2010 through 2014, six or eight of the ten fastest growing economies in the world were in sub-Saharan Africa. And then with the commodity crash, obviously that, that, um, that, uh, that growth sort of went away and now we see the growth coming back. But I think that sort of masks larger, larger dynamics, which I'm sure uh, Dr. S uh, Selassie will talk about. But, but I guess if there is one, one sort of theme that came out of this is, as I said, it's about the change. I mean, even since the report was sort of written, we've seen you know, political change in South Africa that really augurs well for the region, political change in Angola, political change in uh, Ethiopia, political change in Zimbabwe. And, and I was reminded uh, um, President Alassane Ouattara was here in Washington last fall, and he made the point that when he became president in 2011, there were some 11,000 UN peacekeepers in the country and there was negative uh, growth, negative 4% growth. Today, um, seven years later, there are no UN peacekeepers, and Cote d'Ivoire is one of the fastest growing uh, uh, countries, uh, economies on, on, on the continent. So I think that's sort of the background. I think the way we're going to do this is Dr. Selassie will talk for 10 minutes, and then my friend and colleague, uh, uh, cool, uh, uh, Dr. Kuli Baba. Bali will talk for another 10 minutes, comment on the report, and then we'll do some questions here, take some questions from the floor. I know this is being streamed live, so 
Uh, folks are invited to send questions in via email um, or Twitter. And um, I think we should just jump into it. So over to you, Abebe. Thank you very much uh, with me. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for, for coming. Uh, hi, uh, Naima. Um, so uh, let me uh, say a little bit. Uh, I, I thought I wouldn't uh, bore you with a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, we'll instead try and, uh, give uh, as brief a summary as I can of this uh, report we put out a couple of weeks ago. It's called the Regional Economic Outlook for Northern Africa. We, uh, you know, have three main messages in, in, in the report. Uh, the first point we make is that uh, after uh, a period of two, three years of very, um, very poor economic uh, growth outcomes in the region for the lion's share of, for quite a large number of countries, mainly commodity exporters, we're seeing for the region as a whole uh, a pickup in economic growth. Uh, in, in particular, in two thirds of the countries in the region, we are this year going to see an acceleration in economic growth. Um, so uh, there is the story of one of economic recovery. That's uh, our first message. The second message, uh, though, is that the decline in commodity prices uh, that countries were hit by last couple of years has been a very uh, significant shock to the region. And one of the manifestations of this uh, that countries will need to work through going forward is that debt vulnerabilities, the level of public debt, has increased markedly in an increasing number of countries. And uh, this is a concern uh, that needs to be addressed by policies uh, going forward. And then the third one is, uh, third point uh, that we make is that, you know, it really, really is uh, critical that this recovery is not wasted and countries use this opportunity to um, reduce the debt vulnerabilities I highlighted, but also to, to effect a handover of uh, the sources of growth from the public sector more to the private sector going uh, forward. And there's a need to focus uh, um, as well as one said, like a laser beam on, on po fostering higher private investment growth uh, uh, in many countries um, in the region. So these are our through three uh, main messages. Uh, drilling a little bit into each one of these. Uh, first, on the outlook, um, you know, the region uh, is set to see growth accelerating from around 2.8% last year to 3.4%, 3. Uh, and ac you know, strengthening even further to uh, 3.4% uh, this year and then 3.8% uh, next year. This, of course, is well short of uh, the very high growth rates the region was enjoying um, until 2015-16, uh, 5-6% uh, or more. However, I should note that this 3.5% growth that we're seeing this year also masks quite considerable uh, heterogeneity within the region. So 3.8% is for the region as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, there are you know, a good 20, 25 countries that have continued to grow at 5 6% in the last couple of years. These are countries that don't rely so much on commodities uh, and so have not been affected so much by the commodity price crash. By the same token, some of our very large countries like Angola, South Africa, Nigeria were hit by the commodity price uh, decline and have been impacted and they uh, are just now seeing, uh, are just now emerging from uh, recession. So very diverse set of um, outcomes in the region. Uh, there are about eight oil exporting countries in Sub-Saharan Africa the likes of Angola, Nigeria, and a number of the countries in the Central uh, African Monetary Zone, the CEMAC countries, the likes of Congo, Gabon, uh, Cameroon. These countries continue to be impacted quite considerably by, by the effects of the commodity price decline and are you know, still working through the, the effects. And we, we, still see, um, we still see quite significant macroeconomic imbalances uh, in these uh, countries. Uh, one last point I want to bring out in terms of the heterogeneity of growth outcomes is that, you know, uh, there remain quite a few countries where uh, unrest and civil conflict are also a drag on growth. So the likes of, uh, you know, DRC, if not the whole country, then the eastern part of DRC, South Sudan, of course. Um, so there are places where there is still quite, you know, the challenge remains one of, one of, um, mainly of a political nature and bringing about uh, resolution to these uh, conflicts. You know, it would be remiss if I didn't highlight some of the broad factors that have weighed in on the economic recovery we are seeing in the region. 
the global economy has been strengthening uh, as we've been, uh, the, you know, as we've seen in the last six to uh, nine months. And an important driver of the recovery in the region has also been this uh, pickup in global economic activity or the acceleration of uh, uh, global growth, uh, notably, of course, in the U.S. Um, in the European Union, who are both uh, expected to be uh, who are expanding about half a percentage points faster than we were expecting last year. This has had the effect of lifting commodity prices. Um, you know, oil prices right now are uh, heading towards eighty dollar a barrel um, for the region. So this has also been a factor that has facilitated some of the recovery. And you know, another important factor for Sub-Saharan Africa in particular has been the easing of global financing conditions. Uh, we've seen spreads on uh, on uh, borrowing costs for many countries in the region. Uh, narrowing and the volume of capital flows to the region also increasing quite um, quite significantly uh, over the last uh, year year and a half so these have all uh, facilitated uh, the recovery that uh, we are seeing still uh, you know we we are kind of cautioning about you know getting carried away with the with the recovery that we are seeing in, in uh, countries uh, over the medium term as I noted earlier we still see growth just below a four percent mark uh, on current policies um, so uh, you know in per capita terms that's only around one percent on average through the region so there's still a need to accelerate and reinvigorate the sources of growth uh, and I'll come back to what's needed uh, in that regard uh, let me outline a little bit, you know, we're a macroeconomic institution, so, uh, you know, of course, an important focus of the dialogue we have with countries is our uh, macro policy issues. Um, you know, uh, as I s mentioned earlier, w one of the things we've seen, of course, is that with the hit to growth, with the hit to revenues in the oil exporting countries, um, and very aggressive spending in the countries that have continued to grow rapidly. What we've seen is public debt levels in the region uh, increasing uh, in a quite pronounced way over the last uh, couple of years, well, over the last you know five eight years. Um, so going forward, there is a need to focus uh, squarely on this rising debt levels uh, in the region. Um, so one of the initiatives we're emphasizing uh, is the need to strengthen revenue mobilization, tax revenue mobilization, um, you know, going and, you know, uh, in a very significant way, targeting, uh, t targeting uh, revenue mobilization as a main policy lever to address this debt uh, increase. One op another option, of course, would be to cut spending, but, you know, al almost every country in the region continues to have tremendous spending needs uh, to help address the, you know, uh, the development objectives that they have for health, for education, infrastructure spending. So what's really needed is to raise more revenues, uh, which could then be used to help pay for these, um, for these objectives, and also uh, limit the, the increases in deficits that would otherwise occur. So that's a very important uh, policy priority. Second one we feel is, uh, as I noted at the beginning, um, options to um, you know uh, policies and reforms to make sure to facilitate increases in private uh, investment um, in the lion's share of countries over the last few years we've seen uh, the public sector public investment being a, you know uh, an important driver of uh, economic growth in the region and there is a need to to uh, have a handover to of you know the drivers of growth to the private sector so this is also uh, an important area of focus I want to say a little bit also on public debt uh, to be very, very clear what our messages are because it's been very much in, uh, in uh, the headlines uh, the last couple of months. The concern that we have is that, you know, not the level of debt itself going up, but rather that um, the level of debt, you know, the level the with this increase in level of debt, uh, government revenues have not increased sufficiently to be able to service the debt the higher level of debt. Huh? Um, so, uh, in a more dynamic, uh, in a more dynamic sense, what we are uh, asking countries to do is, you know, there's been a lot of investment in uh, in infrastructure, in particular in the region, uh, in the last several years, and what's now needed as a policy focus is trying to capture the the rates of return on this investment, uh, so that the debt, the higher debt, uh, can be serviced uh, in the coming uh, years. The number of countries. Um, uh, where we've seen um, where we've seen uh, debt levels approaching, uh, you know, where w what we call that are actually in debt distress is around six. 
in the region as a whole. Um, another nine countries are, are um, at high risk of death distress. So out of around the, the 45 countries in the region, you know, it's only six that are actually in, in uh, death distress and, are, and unable to service their debt. You know, so uh, go, go, this is both a warning and, um, you know, a, and a direction in which countries need to move. So if the n that number of countries that are in debt distress is not to increase, we think, you know, what's needed is the focus on, uh, on uh, revenue mobilization so that countries are more comfortable uh, servicing the debt levels that, uh, that uh, they have now and also can continue to spend and address their development spending um, needs. So uh, uh, alongside tackling this uh, debt challenge, um, you know, um, we think it's very important to, uh, to uh, address the drivers of private sector growth uh, and some of the initiatives that have actually already started, uh, you know, being uh, put in place, we think provide some of the answer. Uh, I was very excited by the announcement of the uh, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that was uh, announced in Kigali uh, a couple of months ago. We th I think this is something that will help facilitate uh, uh, the expansion of trade in the region. Of course, a lot will depend on how it's implemented, but I think that's an important initiative. But, you know, uh, other ways of fostering competitiveness are also going to be uh, needed some attention uh, by governments uh, and policymakers um, in, the going in the months going forward. Let me end my remarks by saying, you know, um, it's important to put uh, what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa in context. Uh, uh, I think it's a region uh, that holds by far the, you know, incredible promise going forward and we remain very very optimistic about uh, what will happen uh, in the coming years i have one reason for this a personal reason <laughs> which is you know i was uh, i went back to my country to work in the early 90s um, when it was emerging uh, from conflict uh, and things were really really difficult that was uh, some 25 years ago and if you'd asked me 25 years ago whether sub-saharan africa would be where it is now i would have you know i, I would have said what are you smoking? Uh, the progress I've seen in the region, the changes I've seen in the region from that low base have really, really been remarkable. Uh, and with the stronger institutions, with the stronger policy frameworks that we now see in the lion's share of countries, I think going forward, th there really is a very, very strong possibility of even faster uh, catch up with the rest of the, um, with the rest of the world. The key, the challenge, really is how to unlock the, the how to unlock um, and address the the policy constraints that are holding uh, catch up growth being higher at the six, seven, or, or higher levels, and that's uh, what we are working on uh, with policymakers uh, day in day out. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Bevy, thank you very much for the uh, the great overview of what's um, a very interesting uh, report <coughs> with a lot of different material in it. Before we get into like more Q and A, let me ask Cool to uh, make some remarks uh, based on the presentation and and and, and, and the larger report. <coughs> okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Whitney, and uh, to Monday and the Wilson Center uh, for inviting me to uh, to discuss uh, this uh, this report. Um, so let me first actually begin by uh, congratulating Abe and his colleagues at the fund uh, for this really great report. Uh, I thought the choice of the topics as well as the key messages were on point. So which makes my job as a discussion even more difficult and tricky. <laughs> so how do you <laughs> play devil's advocate to a report that looks uh, quite good? Um, so I figure perhaps what might be useful is for me to um, bring a little bit more color to some of those key messages uh, and then try to link it up a little bit more with uh, some of our priorities at uh, Brookings uh, in terms of how we think about Africa's, uh, Africa's story. So the report has basically uh, three chapters. Uh, the first is on the growth outlook, the second is on domestic resource mobilization, and the third is on private sector investment. So beginning with the growth, um, we've seen reports come out of the AFDB early in the year, African Development Bank, also out of the World Bank and the different consensus forecasts. And I think the growth uh, projections that are in the report are broadly consistent. They might be off by a 10th or 2 tenths here and there, but given uncertainties around these 
projections, I think we can declare them broadly consistent. Uh, but I think what is a bit less clear uh, might be the narrative around that growth. So what is the story behind the numbers? And uh, I think up until 2014, like Whitney alluded to, and as well as Abe, the story looked quite simple. You had African countries between 2000 and 2014 growing at six to five to six percent range, and uh, we begin to really talk about an Africa rising uh, narrative, quoted actually by the economists. <laughs> Uh, but then came the terms of trade shock in 2014, and growth tanked to 1.5%. So that's way below even population growth. And since then, it's been staging the recovery, as was alluded to. But that, what that, that has done is actually make the narrative a bit more complex. And uh, some corners, uh, I recall uh, some articles beginning to call for an end of the Africa rising narrative, or beginning to question whether that promise was a bit oversold. So what we did is to look a little bit into the numbers, and then um, what we realized is that really the aggregate growth numbers are being driven by really three large countries, Angola, Nigeria, South Africa. So once you take those three countries out of the aggregate, or you focus on country-specific growth uh, analysis, a significantly brighter picture emerges. So um, Abebe alluded to 3.4%. For the current year, if you take out those three, you're looking at 5%. Growth is going to rise through 2023, 22 to uh, 4%. If you take out those three, you're all of a sudden at uh, 6% or more. But uh, importantly, you're going to notice like half of the fastest growing economies are on the continent, and several of them, 20 or so, are growing at 5% or more. But importantly, over the next five years, you're going to have more countries growing at a rate that is equal or faster than the rate which prevailed when we were all excited about the Africa rising narrative. So then I wondered, why the preemptive skepticism? And I think it's because we've been trying to tell a single story. And maybe we need to step a, a bit away from that and begin to now uh, come to terms with the fact that these countries could be evolving on different tracks and try to tell a story based on the country's uh, specific fundamentals and the merits of their respective policies. So differentiation will be key in, in trying to get a, a good handle on the narrative going, uh, going forward. So uh, clearly some countries are struggling, the commodity dependent countries, uh, but let me put it in context that the size of the shock, the experience was quite large. Uh, I think if you look at the oil price shock in real terms, it could have been the largest perhaps since the 70s. At the time, I was at the Federal Reserve uh, in charge of emerging market economy, and I can tell you that all uh, countries that were dependent or high, large exporters of oil all suffered, including Mexico, which actually had a hedge in the financial markets against the drop in oil prices. But because they only hedged one year at a time, they had to front load the adjustment. So this is just to basically suggest that the shock was large and it's understanding why some countries would, would, be, would be struggling. And where we see a story of struggle, I also see a story of great resilience in terms of the number of countries that will continue to uh, show really great growth rates. But this is not to suggest that all is well, and I certainly share some of the risks that were raised uh, in, the, in the report. In fact, all of the risks that were raised in the report and I think in particular from now on, it's going to be critical for the policymakers to play a very good um, balancing act of basically consolidating the recovery where they need to uh, preserve or restore um, macro stability and create policy space, all the while being able to sustain progress on their development uh, agendas. And that is, in the end, the most critical element. So that's where I find the two chapters on uh, uh, domestic resource mobilization and, and uh, private sector um, uh, in investment uh, mobilization quite important. Because the critical element that Abe stressed, which is right, is that the debt level has been rising. And to underscore that the debt level itself uh, you know, at around 50, 55 or so is not, I would say, alarming 
for the average country, although there are some who are now like about 100% or so, that's certainly cause for concern. So in context, the level is reasonable on average. Uh, but the features that worry me, uh, that concern me, have been the pace of increase. It's gone up quite fast, about 20 percentage points from the low 30s to uh, about uh, low 50s, just between 2013 and 2017. That's quite fast. And then second, the other feature of the debt is that now it's more denominated, it's more commercial-based uh, debt, which means that interest payments on it are higher even when the debt level is low. So that's a cause for concern. And then it's also denominated in a foreign currency, which means that if the global financial conditions turns against those countries, we can go from a reasonably okay debt situation all of a sudden to find ourselves in a, uh, in a, in a debt distress. So that's cause also for, for concern. But for the African countries, uh, how do you address those debt issues while making sure that you're continuing to finance the key priorities of your development agenda. And the recommendations I get out of the report is basically step up domestic resource mobilization and boost uh, private, uh, private saving. And it is true that infrastructure is, the, uh, uh, infrastructure is what's m missing the most in Africa. It's quite critical. But the recent estimates, I think, coming out of the African Development Bank uh, most recent report is that 42% of that infrastructure is being financed through government balance sheets. And private investment only accounts for 4%. So that is quite low. And now that you need to stop accumulating debt, how do you ensure that you're continuing to finance well uh, your, uh, your infrastructure need and other investment needs? Um, so that's where I think Emphasizing domestic resource mobilization, which is always a necessity, because it's the largest or most reliable form of financing. But it's now moved from a necessity to now become an imperative going forward. And it's actually also a key part of our strategy uh, at, uh, uh, at Brookings. And uh, to put it sort of in context, if you look at the uh, region saving rates, it's on average about 15%, uh, the national saving rates which is also sim another word for domestic, resource, uh, uh, domestic resources. But the investment needs of the continent, given how far back they are on the development agendas, is somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of investments as a share of GDP. That's what they need over a sustained period of time to be able to make a meaningful difference. So we've calculated that that is about $275 billion a year. So that is a conundrum. How do you, where do you find an additional $275 billion a year? And then that's where being able to uh, crowd in more private sector investment, so government balance sheets are preserved, will be quite useful, but then uh, mobilize more domestic resources. And among domestic resources, taxes are basically also the most important element. And uh, interestingly, we've done some similar exercise to what you've done in the report. And uh, amazingly, the results are consistent. Uh, what we find is that if Africans, there's, a, there's some about four percentage point on average of GDP that is lost to inefficiencies. And I think your report find maybe three to five percent. So we're sort of, we hit the middle of, <laughs> of your, uh, your, your estimate there. But that translates into about $85 billion. And we find that in our study that that can be addressed by strengthening uh, two elements. One is corruption. The second is, g is uh, 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 democratic accountability. If those are significantly addressed, you can close that gap. Okay. But we go beyond that, right, because and take a bit more of a multifaceted approach to domestic resource mobilization. Another important component of it is illicit capital flows. We've also done some recent estimates, and uh, both still preliminary. I say that because I want to cover Landry here, who's leading our work on it. <laughs> our estimates are showing somewhere around $60 billion a year. That's a lot of money. Now, if you add $60 billion a year to uh, the $85 billion in terms of taxes, you're all of a sudden at $145 billion, and that is enough to cover the infrastructure financing gap which the AFDB estimated at about $108 billion. 
But to do these two components too, we have natural resources. We need to strengthen government governance there. So all in all, if you take a multifaceted approach to domestic resource mobilization, my conviction, which is being borne out by the, some of the numbers we're doing, we're estimating, is that Africa has a lot of internal resources to finance much of its development need. We just need to harness them better and align them well with the development uh, priorities. Um, so in broadly speaking, or in, uh, in summary, I think we very much uh, agree with the key messages of the report. Um, and another uh, uh, category, or at least work stream that we have, which uh, will be good to, to see more on, on this in the next editions of the, uh, 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 the IMF's uh, uh, regional economic outlooks, will be the, situa the job situation in Africa. It is really one area where that keeps me up at night, if you will. Uh, as good as growth has been in several countries, the job creation has just not been there. It hasn't been sufficient. And growth obviously is not an end in itself. It should be a means to an end. And that end is really the improvements of livelihoods. So when growth is not creating enough jobs and we have about 10 to 12 million young people entering the labor force each year, that's a challenge. And that is on top of already those who are unemployed or underemployed. But then to make this even more complicated, is now that you have a lot of uh, automation, technological advancements, which despite all of its great benefits, create significant challenges to African policymakers where job creation is priority number one, priority number two, and priority number three. Um, we also, we, we've done some work in trying to think of ways in which jobs can be generated and uh, one of our senior fellow has some interesting insights that are coming out in a book, hopefully over the summer. And we're also doing some events looking at Industry 4.0 and what could be those implications for Africa. So I look very much look forward to uh, seeing the Abe and his colleagues take on <laughs> uh, the future of work and uh, yeah, what, what are the implications for Africa. Thank you. Cool, thank you very much for that. A lot of food for thought has been put on the table, and I think a fair amount of food for conversation as well. Um, so let's just jump into it. I, I, I think one of the issues that I want to ask you first about is the debt versus productivity conundrum. And I'll just read one sentence here that I think sort of captures that. Um, with, with debt levels high and rising in many countries in the region, this is from the report, there is an increased focus on other options. And we didn't really talk about uh, Africa's partners and stakeholders. Countries are participating in external initiatives such as the, the G20's compact with Africa and, and the provision of infrastructure and China's Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to help the region better integrate into global value chains. So here's my question. You know, as, as, as Cole noted, uh, much of the concern uh, over debt is sort of the governments turning to the euro bond market. But clearly, China plays a role in this as well. Foresight, uh, that was published by AGI, had a figure that, that China was responsible for 14% of Africa's debt, which is a pretty high number. And at FOCAC 2015, loans of $20 billion a year were going to be given for three years. But, it, but implied in this report is that, you know, through more infrastructure, which a lot of these Chinese loans are going for, and there have been some 3,000 infrastructure projects, more productivity comes out of these investments. So, so how, how are you seeing this at the fund, sort of the lending versus the increased productivity? Can we have both, I guess, is the question. An easy one to start. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, a few thoughts on this. So, you know, uh, borrowing is part of the macroeconomic toolkit, which almost every country uses, mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, developing countries more so, uh, for a host of reasons. Um, uh, government, you know, the amount of revenues government collects uh, is very limited, and yet the the spending needs, the demands, uh, 
th th that they have to address their development objectives incredibly, you know, just unending. So, um, you know, there's always a fiscal deficits are very common mm. in, uh, in uh, developing and emerging market countries, and borrowing can be part of the answer uh, to address um, to address that gap, but to a limit. Right? Um, I think it's important that the again to bring out the heterogeneity uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, borrowing uh, levels and draw attention to the fact that you know it, re it still is um, six countries that are in debt distress and another eight or nine countries where debt levels have become high and you know red lights are are flashing if you will. Um, so, you know, the other 45 countries in uh, the rest of the region, uh, sorry, the other 30 countries in the rest of the region continue to have manageable mm. debt levels. Um, and c clearly, kind of, you know, a short answer would be that they, in those cases, you are seeing a situation where they are borrowing and subject to, subject to uh, them not, you know, continuing to rely excessively on uh, deficit financing. Uh, that's a case where um, product, in a way, productivity is good mm -hmm. for itself. But um, so, uh, who you borrow? I mean, you know, the China versus uh, Euro bond markets. I mean, right. you know, it again varies from country to country in terms of how much, uh, what the source of financing is. I think the key thing that um, we we all, um, you know, in terms of the work we do, uh, what we focus on is one is ag the aggregate level of debt uh, to make sure that mm. you don't borrow uh, beyond what is. Uh, what is reasonable, and that of course depends on you know uh, how much revenues you have, uh, both now and going forward, how much you are going to be increasing, and um, and that again is linked, I think, to what you use the resources for. So the more you use the resources for uh, for uh, the highest productive, the, high the projects with the highest rates of returns, uh, then it's easier it is to service the debt. The weakness we s I see in the region is um, that often. Uh, you know, I think in some, you know, I don't want to specify the countries, but we see uh, borrowing to invest, for example, in, uh, you know, electricity generation capacity. So the power plant comes on stream, uh, the electricity is being s provided, yeah. but the utility is not allowed to charge um, the, you know, the rates that it yeah. needs to, uh, to be able to service the debt. Then that debt migrates to the public sector balance sheet. I see. Okay. So uh, and uh, this is why kind of, you know, when, when we talk about domestic revenue mobilization, uh, tax revenue mobilization, it really is uh, those kind of initiatives we're also talking about, not just general taxes, but also capturing the rate of return on the investments that uh, governments are making. Uh, you know, doing those kind of interventions would go a long way to making sure that debt levels would be sustainable and productive. Right. So, so, so that sort of goes to subsidies, right? Implicit or explicit subject. Exactly, which is, I guess is a whole different subject in its own right. But I, w I wonder if you wanted to comment on on Abe's answer to the debt product, debt slash productivity. Yeah, no, I think clearly it's a story of uh, you know how you spend the debt. Uh, debt itself is been a feature of uh, development strategies. Uh, but if you need to spend in a way that ensures that you are able to get some return, that would allow you then to to kind of pay for it. And I think um, my reading is basically that a lot of the debt has gone to indeed finance human infrastructure, which is productivity enhancing, obviously. Uh, but some of it has also uh, gone into to, to consumption. And that is not the best use of, uh, of, uh, of the debt, because then the returns, and you don't get the return necessary to, uh, to pay it off. Um, but the, but Im Im importantly, I think, the fact that the countries were able to come on the market, to me, was a good thing. On the international market should tap into uh, was a good thing because ultimately it's going to be a feature of their own economic development. And being able also to subject themselves to the discipline of the market, I think, was also important. You just need to make sure that it is not overdone and that doing so is uh, comes with a clear understanding of the risks that are embedded uh, into that debt because all of a sudden if the global rates begin to rush it up quite quickly, then all of a sudden you can find yourself in, in some, uh, some kind of trouble. Mm. Uh, I think that's an important element. And then the second element, you've mentioned China, but there's also other types of creditors. The creditor landscape has also changed. Uh, it used to be dominated by various club members, but now you have a plurality of, of, of creditors. 
And the implication of that is that basically, if a country ever finds itself in trouble, uh, it's not quite clear what is the framework currently for a debt resolution mechanism. And uh, a, an African country is sort of trying hard to achieve its development agendas, being in a debt uh, crisis is gonna step the country back mm. for several years. Uh, so that worries me, and then the final element of it is basically a lot of uh, uh, data gaps that don't even allow us to get a good assessment or sense for how much can all of a sudden find itself in the government balance sheet. And I think we've seen instances in some countries where uh, debt was all of a sudden discovered. Right. And I think those are the practices that uh, uh, we need to, to kind of avoid. Otherwise, um, issuing debt uh, is not a bad thing, it's just the way you use it. Yeah, no, just, just to underscore that, I mean, the debt relief in the early 2000s, that was all pretty much official debt, so, you know, IMF, U.S., bilateral debt that could be written off by governments. I think we're in a, we are in uncharted mm -hmm. uh, territory. But, uh, but I want to go to this issue of uh, private investment, certainly something I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on. The points made in the, in the report that the amount of, of foreign investment uh, that Africa tracks is actually about two percentage points lower than any other developing economy region. And I'm just interested, sort of looking forward, if you can switch hats, if I can ask you to switch hats, you know, what, what are the recommendations for attracting more foreign direct investment to Africa? And, you know, how do you, how do you raise that with your with with the governments with which you interact, is it is it just sort of using the uh, the indicators and, and 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 growing increasing your ranking, or is it something else? So you know, um, whereas kind of the macro challenge uh, you can see as being common in many countries, mm -hmm. so revenue mobilization I think is important part of the agenda in you know really across the region. When it comes to private investment, in terms of how to address that, I think it's much more country specific, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you maybe a couple of examples. So at one extreme is probably a country like South Africa, where I think, you know, uh, at least in the short term, what is need, you know, what one of the constraints of private investment, why private investment has declined, has been the very, you know, uh, high uncertainty, political uncertainty, uh, economic uncertainty over the last, um, four or five years. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues did an exercise to look at what would happen to uh, private investment if it were to revert back to the post-global uh, financial crisis peak, which was in 2011. So if private investment, instead of where it is at now, was back at 2011 levels, mm. which itself is low, right? Mm. But if it's simply to revert back there, growth would be of the order of 3%. Mm. So. I think you know that's really largely attributable to uh, maybe partly to the commodity cycle, but I think more to the political environment. So that's a case where to get a, to boost the private investment in the near term, I think the focus has to be on alleviating the sources of uncertainty, etc. In Nigeria, you know, I think uh, really uh, infrastructure probably plays a really important role. Eh? Uh, you know, without uh, significant energy provision without better infrastructure, road networks, port uh, access, I think it's going to be difficult to see higher levels of private investment. Uh, mm. So you see, you know, uh, why private investment is not higher, I think really varies from country to country. Right. And yet other countries, um, the challenge uh, is uh, sometimes policy induced. Uh, mm. So there may be restrictions on uh, on uh, market entry into certain sectors, uh, telecom or um, or other sectors. So alleviating those policy constraints will be important. So I think private investment, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say kind of, you know, there's, uh, there's one or two things that need to be done across the region. Mm. And we, we, you know, in the work we do, we drill in country by country. I mean, even in South Africa, it's, you know, we don't just want to simply say uncertainty, but we will look at, you know, product market uh, constraints, uh, uh, you know, uh, labor market issues that may be constraining investment. So I think th that's one of those areas where a lot more granular, we, we do a very granular work to try and identify mm. what the constraints mm. are. I must say in South Africa, is very encouraged that President Ramaphosa has appointed the four special envoys to go out and sort of attract investment, Promote, yeah. to pull it in uh, and, and set a target of $100 billion. I think that's, you know, it's different and it's, and, and, and it's quite helpful. 
Cool. You're involved in advising the G20 and the Compact with Africa, which is also involved, you know, in, in the foreign in improving foreign direct investments. What have you found through that? Is that is that bearing bearing fruit? Right, but you know, just to uh, elaborate, so the uh, the Compact Proof Africa is basically this new, um, well, not so long, no, not so new anymore. <laughs> it's uh, it was set up last year under the presidency of the uh, under the German presidency of the G20 uh, to basically help boost private sector investment across the continent. So it's basically it's a structured partnership, really, between the G20 volunteering African countries and uh, multilateral organizations, including the IMF and World Bank, Africa, African Development Bank. Um, so it has uh, three main frameworks, uh, which touches on the financing framework, the macro stability, and the business, uh, uh, business framework. I think the idea there is to be able then to um, work with the governments to help bring about solutions to the concerns of private investors. Uh, in some sense, it might mean coming up with instruments to help mitigate uh, the, the risks sufficiently that investors now feel comfortable going on to the continent. Um, so ultimately, it's a longer term, I would say, kind of agenda. Uh, but it is a strong uh, program in the sense that it is basically, it's, it's relatively flexible uh, since it's the countries have to be, uh, to sign up for it voluntarily. And then it doesn't really specify where investment needs to go, which allows countries then to tailor the particular program they want financed uh, to, uh, through the compact and align those basically with their own development agendas. Um, so currently we are in the process of uh, doing, a, doing a review of uh, the one year anniversary. No, it wasn't one that was gonna give us quick wins, mm -hmm. but at least it was going to set in motion a process. And then uh, through the one year review, which we'll be conducting very soon and making recommendations for what adjustment needs to be made to kind of act to accelerate it. But currently there are 11 countries that are involved with the, with the, with the compact and uh, those in it have been quite optimistic about uh, uh, its ability to help address, or uh, help boost the private sector investment. But it's going to require more, uh, more work on the different uh, of stakeholders uh, to really see it uh, come to full success. Great, thank you. Let me ask one more question and then we'll open it up. Uh, so please get ready with questions. But que the last question I wanted to ask is, is about the role of technology and economic growth and economic development because there was sort of one, one small section on technology um, in, in the report. Um, and I think one of the dynamics that, that, that I see is you know, the whole explosion of, of, of mobile financial services um, across the continent, particularly in East Africa really is, is having a, a transformative impact in the way in which people live and their ability to, to share money, to s generate revenue, to create jobs through technology. And I was just curious, is that, is that more anecdotal on my part or are, are, you, are, you, really s or are you seeing technology as, as a factor that can impact on, on, acceler on accelerated growth? Oh, thanks. I think, you know, um, th this is, y there is this sense kind of, you know, Africa is the backwater for, for um, technology. But, I, I, you know, as you were just touching on, I, 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 I think um, both what technology has done so far and what it will do going forward really, really will be um, very significant. Uh, I think, you know, the mobile money space is the one which everybody knows about, you know, how, uh, out of necessity, eh, because large tracts of right. the population were unbanked um, uh, or have very limited access to financial services. We've seen how, um, how mobile money payment services, transfer services have completely taken off uh, right. in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but I, I think what's going to happen going forward is will also be much more revolutionary still, simply because mm -hmm. in, in a couple of ways. One is um, the more indirect way in which um, know-how, uh, knowledge is diffusing to the region much faster thanks to the, to the um, ubiquity of mobile uh, mm -hmm. uh, internet services on the phone, etc. I think that is the much, much more powerful 
way in which you know this d diffusion of knowledge is what's going to help facilitate um, um, higher convergence growth. I think that 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 whole side we see already unfolding, and I think uh, increasingly uh, mm. uh, becoming a factor going forward. And then uh, there is also. Uh, to the extent that governments are more actively uh, leveraging technology, I think they can also help uh, accelerate growth. So uh, even leaving aside kind of, you know, um, uh, leaving aside what they could do for the private sector, even for government service provision, right? Mm -hmm. I was in Accra a couple of days ago, and I, I was struck by the initiative that they have going to um, basically uh, uh, have an electronic uh, address system uh, down to the smallest uh, you know area you can imagine uh, f for the whole of Accra and beyond the whole mm. country really um, uh, so that you know you finding your way around uh, in the city will be much easier but more importantly to uh, identify poverty uh, to do urban planning better urban planning to mm. provide services for uh, for the city and of course for the government also to know who's living where and be able to collect more taxes mm. uh, more property taxes registration so you know uh, leaving aside what uh, technology will do for the private sector even if the governments were to uh, leverage and use technology better they could provide much better services be more efficient uh, save a lot of resources so uh, i think uh, this is a sp you know this is a place uh, a space to to watch uh, in africa and i think it's going to be one where which allows the region to converge quicker uh, and uh, have faster catch-up growth. So uh, I, I see this space taking off going forward. Yeah, qu it's quite interesting. I was in Nairobi a couple of weeks ago talking to a banker there, and his bank, they've developed an algorithm that, based on your, you know, your, your, your history of, of who you pay and how much you pay, develops your own credit record, mm -hmm. which... And, and now they can make you know credit available up to hundred, two hundred dollars just based on your use, which is really quite revolutionary. Cool. I love you to comment. Yeah, on no, that no. As well. Yes, no, absolutely. I personally really am quite excited about the uh, about about technologies. I I, I really think it is um, a it's 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 a sector uh, that Africa can really leverage to make significant progress and address several of these development challenges in various, various sectors. Uh, the stage as which it is, I think the mobile penetration has been uh, quite great. It's been the fastest uh, about in the world. And as you're, you're seeing currently now, even in many countries, uh, more people having a mobile uh, bank account than actually having a physical uh, bank accounts. And technology bringing about solutions in really in various sectors including even domestic resource mobilization. We've seen the case of uh, Emma Kiba in Kenya, where for the first time uh, uh, they were able to issue retail bonds, uh, a small amounts, $20, $30, to rural, rural farmers, who up until then were keeping their, mon their money under the mattress. But now they were able to earn 10% return on those funds, and at the same time the government was able to mobilize in a record amount of time a large sum of money to finance its infrastructure needs. So it created like kind of like a win-win situation. Um, to me, what needs to happen then is for um, many of these solutions to basically be scaled up and for experiences to be shared and broadened uh, across the continent. Uh, I sometimes wonder why, if we see one country do something very successfully, why does it take long for the neighbor that has the same challenges to adopt the same solution. Um, so clearly, uh, facilitating also the infrastructure around technology, which means having adequate regulation, so it doesn't become more of an impediment to te technological adoption, since that does come up as you talk to some of the tech entrepreneurs on the, on the continent. And in fact, to uh, a tech entrepreneur from one of those countries, I asked the question as to why is it that this other country has been doing this well uh, why aren't you guys in your country replicating this? And the answer he gave me was that, uh, unfortunately, it's not so much why we're not doing it fast enough, is why they were able to, to do it without regulators stopping them. Mm -hmm. uh, it means regulators, at the time they caught on, it was already reached a proportion where they couldn't do anything about it. So having regulation really be conducive will be quite critical. And government's role, obviously, providing more connectivity, because that continues to be quite low.
Uh, and I think if you provide connectivity and then you facilitate the adoption of technology, uh, the, the, the solutions uh, we're gonna see uh, are gonna be quite amazing. And to me, it's the sector that I'm most excited about in terms of helping address several, several of the development challenges we're currently facing yeah. on the continent. Yeah, great, great, thank you. Well, let me open it up and ask uh, anybody if they've got questions or if there's some questions online. Sir, please identify yourself and, and your affiliation. There's a, there's a microphone here as well. Thanks, and thanks for your, this really interesting panel and the report. My name is uh, Andy Snow. I'm the State Department Fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace this year. Uh, I worked on the HIPAA initiative back in the day in the Paris Club and stuff, so it's interesting, your comments on debt. I think, Dr. Klebel, you made a critical point on the absence of a crisis resolution mechanism if the debt levels do get reach a crisis point, as opposed to the previous debt crisis. But that's not what I want to ask you about, <laughs> which is, uh, isn't looming over the very long term a major challenge and threat to uh, African economic growth in the rate of population growth. I think you s I found, I haven't read, given your report the close study it merits yet, but I noticed you did say in there that uh, I believe that per capita GDP growth is basically not really grown. And I know that some of the African countries have some of the highest uh, population growth rates in the world. So if you're taking a 10, 20 year horizon, isn't this just going to make the problem that you, Dr. Kulibaly, say is keeping you up at night about jobs that much worse? And shouldn't that be a major uh, development focus for the government? Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, certainly the uh, very rapid demographic growth is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the key challenges. But let me take a step back and say demographic growth itself uh, doesn't have to be a challenge. In fact, it could be an opportunity. Uh, but perhaps the question to ask is, uh, what are we doing to harness that demographic uh, dividend? Because failure then to harness it makes it now turn into a demographic kind of liability. Uh, clearly, Africa has a very rapid uh, population growth. And I think by the turn of the century, it's going to be home at the current rates to maybe 40% of the world's population, but also be home to 40% of the world's workforce. Uh, and then that can have the opportunity to provide an offset perhaps to population aging we're seeing uh, elsewhere, say in Asia or in advanced economies where we talk about an elderly bulge which could be, an, uh, be offset by a, a youth bulge uh, coming out of Africa. But unless we're able then to put them to work, then we're not harnessing that dividend. So the question now is how do you put them to work? And in the then we ask our question, then uh, 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 my program we ask the question, how was this done in the past? Because clearly some countries have faced similar challenges. And the way it's happened is that you've had economies evolving from agriculture to developing industry, particularly manufacturing, and then moving on to services. And it's actually that transition of mass labor that is being absorbed by industries and manufacturing that has really allowed the countries to reap the dividends. And that's what I alluded to about the future of work and the challenges caused by technology and automation. The reality nowadays is that manufacturing is no longer able to absorb as much labor as it used to. To give you an example, you look at Britain, early industrializers. They could absorb up to 30, per industries could absorb up to 30% of labor. But nowadays you're looking at maybe 15%. So then how does Africa then develop and create a job if it can no longer do so through the traditional manufacturing. And it's because it's becoming less labor intensive. So then what you're seeing is movement from agriculture straight into services. But those are not high productivity services sectors. They tend to be informal, sort of retail type services. And that is really the key challenge. So uh, the economy is not able to generate then the productivity that it needs. So some of the work we've been doing has been suggesting the development of some other types of industries, which we believe share the same features as manufacturing. Uh, those include horticulture, uh, tourism, agro-processing, et cetera. Uh, the key feature they share with manufacturing is that, number one, they can be traded, so you can expand in terms of scale. It doesn't need to be confined to your own domestic economy's uh, consumption capacity. 
And then number two, it benefits from technological diffusion. So productivity can go up in line with global trends. And then third, and importantly, it's able then to absorb a large number of moderately skilled labor that will be graduating, graduating from agriculture then to be absorbed by those, those sectors. So I think the demographic ch uh, challenge uh, needs to be harnessed, but it will require really developing those uh, labor absorbing uh, sectors. And the work we're putting out is gonna discuss this and we hope that it can find its way in onto some of the Africa's development, uh, uh, development agendas. Otherwise, at this 1%, you're basically looking at 70 years just to be able to double per capita income. 1% uh, GDP per capita growth is just too low. And that's largely because of the demographic. But the question is why isn't growth even higher? Exactly. I think uh, Rahima you, you has answered it comprehensively, but just I, I, the only things I would add is I think, you know, I often see projections for population growth as far out as 21 to 20, you know, at the end of the uh, current century. Uh, but uh, really the important, uh, much of the important factor or the important uh, demographic issues will be unfolding much sooner. Um, just one one number uh, I want to give you in this sense, which is that by 2030, half of the annual increase in uh, global labor force will come from sub-Saharan Africa. Half. 2030 is a short 12 years from now. So I think this relative point uh, that this increase is happening at the same time that uh, working age population in almost everywhere the rest of the world, uh, except perhaps India and a few other countries, is declining, is, is an important differentiator for sub-Saharan Africa. Provided uh, the labor intensity of, of uh, global growth remains the same as it has over the historically, uh, you know, labor force participation, I should say, uh, I still think there will be a lot of demand for sub-Saharan African labor um, and a lot of capital moving in to, to make use of sub-Saharan African labor. So I'm not, uh, I'm a bit more sanguine and less, mm -hmm. less, uh, uh, less uh, pessimistic about what the demographic uh, dividend entails. However, you know, this said, I mean, it's not something um, uh, that is a given, and I think there's an important role for policies uh, to make sure that growth is higher, so you you know you absorb labor force much much more rapidly. Huh? So the population numbers are a given. Uh, so if you ha would need higher per capita income growth, that's uh, we have to have higher growth, uh, which is w why we're focusing on growth uh, so much in our in all our work. Just 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 sticking with the demographic question for a second, one phrase that I don't think I saw in this report was the middle class, right. which is sort of part of Africa's story today that, that talks that tells the tale of people moving out of absolute poverty into into a higher economic bracket. H how do you see that in, in terms of the dynamics playing out right now? You know, um, you know one of the challenges um, in doing more granular work is exactly that household survey uh, type data that you need to to look at the distribution of income is only available every so every so often mm -hmm. so mo on more of these on these structural um, issues like what's happening to uh, to um, you know it's not just of course growth that matters but how how that growth is distributed right. we tend to do this kind of work every four or five years uh, once we have uh, once we have uh, a reasonable number of household surveys, which we can then aggregate and uh, paint a picture about what's uh, what's been happening. Uh, the last report we did, I think, was around 2013-14, looking at what's happening to uh, to uh, 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 how growth has been, uh, you know, how income levels at various tranches have happened. And indeed, a big story over the over the 2010, 20 sorry, 2000, 2010 or so period has been this this increase in uh, in um, the decline in poverty and an increase in the number of uh, Africans you would classify as middle class. Right, right, great. Let me ask another question. Steve, did you? Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Again, I could only glance at the report, so I, it may only be included in it. But the one thing I don't understand, and it's been my challenge for the last 20 years, is why the manufacturing base is not moving in the world like it's supposed to, you know, from China, Middle East, but it's uh, uh, Far East, why it's not moving into Africa. You have the population, the population boom, 
to all these articles. You have a whole section on special economic zones and so on. We've been pushing for one very minor change in AGOA, which is true for any preferential agreement, that if Africa provides an input to a product, because so many products are no increased input, that at least that portion should enter duty-free, even if it finished in the third country, and so on. It's just one thing to do. But most people say, no, we've tried it, and being part of world-class supply lines or, or supply chains in which Africa produces part of a product doesn't work. We have to make sure that Africa is – that a production is integrated in all of African production. Why doesn't it? Why does stuff – why do people go to Bangladesh instead of Africa? Yeah. And I would love an answer to that. <laughs> Thank you again for the part of the report I read. It's excellent because I don't read it any other place but in the stuff that's in this report. L let me have a, a crack at this. Um, uh, so, I, first of all, um, I think, uh, you know, this is a question that's often posed in Africa. I mean, why doesn't Africa industrialize, et cetera? Um, so uh, let me give you a couple of um, ways of thinking about this. I think the first one is, um, in the past, I think the industrialization efforts the, that have been attempted really um, have, have not been organic uh, and have been you know, more trying to graft on uh, into enclave type activities, uh, very small efforts. Uh, so it wasn't born out of, you know, building infrastructure, building, you know, in a, in a scaled type of way, but, you know, uh, the classic case goes back to the 19, uh, late 60s, early 70s is uh, the Ngorongoro shoe factory in northern, uh, northern Tanzania, right? Um, uh, where, because there was a lot of cattle there, it was deemed that uh, you know you could use the skins there to make a shoe factory, but without thinking about the forward backward linkages, you know how the goods would get into into markets, etc. So, the more recent effort to try and uh, provide electricity provision, to try and uh, build infrastructure, I think, um, is laying some of the basis for. Uh, more concerted industrialization effort. So I think the focus in the past has not been appropriate. But this is in terms of what domestic policy interventions can do. Um, I think more globally, uh, I, you know, uh, the emergence of China on the global economic scene, uh, the, the, the so-called China shock in, in, in economic literature here on labor markets, on product markets, really, uh, you know, we, we use it to explain what's been happening to uh, the deindustrialization in many parts of, uh, of uh, the U.S., uh, the Midwest, etc. But somehow we never really relate that to, uh, you know, the, the lack of opportunities for African countries to get onto the global supply chains. Huh? So I think the emergence of China on the global scene uh, in a, such a big way particularly in the last 15-20 uh, years has also crowded out the space for uh, many African countries to join that value chain but with China moving up the technology ladder rapidly we are seeing that process beginning to happen I think Ethiopia is a good example of where uh, that has started to happen um, but uh, what we've needed really is uh, both factors one domestically uh, what <coughs> You know, a more concerted effort to address the the, the infrastructure deficit, the need for energy, or you know, any kind of uh, higher productivity activity requires that. Uh, so uh, that has been that is beginning to get in place now. So I think that uh, will offer a boon. And then the other thing we need now is for China to move up the technology ladder, which is also beginning to happen, albeit slowly. Um, so I think these are the two cross-cutting factors that are needed for Africa to better integrate into, um, to, to, to for us to be able to see, you know, millions and millions more jobs migrating to uh, to Africa. But we're all that are manufacturing in Asia. I don't know. Um, Rahim, I have anything to add? Uh, no, I think the, the, the answer there was uh, quite comprehensive. It looks like uh, you have a question? No, okay. Sorry, thank you so much. I actually have two very quick questions. And I, one is those of us who grew up in HIPAA indebted countries are worried when we hear you talk about the six countries that are in debt distress right now <coughs> and sort of wondering about how they got there and what is being done uh, to stop that from spreading to other African countries and to raise the alarm internationally, particularly in the absence of the framework that uh, Dr. Kolibali was talking about. So I, I think that's one um, 
question for me. And I know you don't like to name countries, but I think an, uh, another question that I would have, that if you look at a combination of um, good development strategy, good monetary policy, good fiscal policy, which are the countries that stand out for you on the African continent as having that good combination of those three things? Name names. <laughs> it's always <laughs> risky. <laughs> but uh, uh, death distress. So on, on uh, death distress, um, yes, of course. I mean, g g which is why we work so hard to minimize, um, you know, the risk of countries uh, falling into debt distress. Um, um, uh, you know, that really is a core focus of, of my institution. Um, but just to give you like a couple of examples of the of those six countries, for example, that are in debt distress are Chad and Republic of Congo. I mean, they're both oil exporters. Um, for them, the massive decline in, uh, you know, the really uh, sharp uh, decline in commodity prices has been a really, really very large shock. Huh? Uh, it has hit both uh, output, but of course revenues also. Um, so um, th th they've fallen into debt distress and need to have, uh, need, to need their debt to, you know, basically rescheduled um, uh, or cut in NPV terms. Um, you know, I, even though we have the sense that the HIPAA initiative was yeah, an easy thing or, you know, somehow having the Paris Club was an easy way of, uh, of uh, restructuring debt. I mean, debt restructuring always, always, always are very, very difficult uh, processes. I think this is true not just for African countries, but everywhere around the world, um, which is why, you know, you need to have prudent policies to avoid <laughs> ever getting into 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 that uh, position uh, and the you know the, the beyond the creditors needing to take a haircut i mean the 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 pain that's imposed domestically when crises unfold is of course even worse still huh? so which is why you, uh, it's important to avoid this but the, um, so th those are the kind of countries that have gotten into debt difficulty, beca either because they've been hit by a very, very large shock, or there have been other cases, uh, Mozambique is one, uh, where there have been um, uh, hidden loans that came out, uh, uh, and you know the resources were not used for, uh, for uh, high return projects, so uh, creating debt sustainability problems. In terms of uh, which one of the, <laughs> the countries are doing well, I mean, you know, <laughs> That's like saying, which w uh, for me at least, which one of your children <laughs> uh, are doing well. I mean, you know, I, 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 it's yeah. the measure of a country is not just uh, of, you know, how, how good your monetary policy or fiscal policy or growth is. You know, it's improvement in standards of living over time. It's a whole host of things, you know, gender participation uh, in economic activity and a whole host of things. So really uh, th this idea we can... Uh, we can narrow countries down to an index with you know, the best business environment, the best macro policy, I think, is, is uh, one I don't uh, subscribe to. So, I, um, you know, so I, but again, suffice it to say that, you know, in country after country, the story we see is one of uh, really improved, you know, greatly improved human development outcomes, importantly, and, uh, you know, per capita income improvements over time uh, in much across the region. Hank. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for an excellent panel. I really enjoyed it. My name is Herman Cohen, retired American diplomat. Uh, I have basically two questions. I think that from what you said, there must be a correlation between the insufficient domestic resource mobilization and the money that's gone abroad, as you say. Uh, illicitly or, or legitimately, uh, what do governments have to do to bring that money back? What incentives should they uh, introduce? And the second question is, uh, OECD countries, and I believe, if I'm not wrong, that World Bank IDA no longer give loans in Africa. It's all grants. How could we persuade China to change to all grants? Okay, um, so on uh, on capital flight of out of Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, you know, um, uh, Brahim has been very kind to me <laughs> in his remarks, uh, and um, so just one th point of difference. You know, I think we see the, the, 
we see what's going on in the region uh, very much uh, alike. But perhaps one point of difference is on this issue of illicit financial flows. I, I have a bit of an issue with that uh, topic because it um, melds together at least three different sources of uh, types of flows. Uh, um, one set of flows are those related to, um, I would say, kind of tax evasion type uh, issues, um, which is, you know, international companies or even domestic companies basically uh, finding ways to hide how much taxes they have to pay by uh, sending money abroad. Uh, you see this in misinvoicing, under invoicing of imports, exports, uh, but if you are companies that are trading abroad. So that's one kind of more evasion type issue. Then there's a second source of flows, outflows, which is, um, you know, good old what we used to call in the old days capital flight. Huh? And th th those are really driven by um, insufficient opportunities to do invest domestically. Uh, uh, you know, sectors are closed for investment, perhaps, or you want to diversify your portfolio. I mean, even domestic investors and, you know, inv African investors also want to have an international portfolio. So there is that kind of capital flight. And then a third set of uh, Outflows are those related to um, uh, the proceeds of corruption or, uh, you know, other nefarious illegal activity, drug money, etc. So I think the phrase uh, illicit financial flows doesn't make a distinction between these three, and and then th and that's why you see these huge numbers being thrown out uh, as flowing out of Africa. So I think the solution to each one of these is very different. So the first bucket of flows that I highlighted, the tax evasion, of, um, those are the ones that domestic revenue mobilization can capture. Uh, so with better, more effective auditing, uh, so uh, there I think there is an effort uh, to be done by domestic uh, revenue authorities, but also by the international community. Yeah? I mean, I think it's, this is also a challenge that uh, we see the U.S. and other countries are facing uh, in terms of you know base erosion and profit shifting. Um, so I, I agree with you that you know more of an effort on those type of flows can can help uh, higher revenue mobilization. Uh, but not necessarily those other flows because you know those are after tax profits which you know can be invested abroad or otherwise on um, financing flows to um, to sub-saharan africa you know um, so most ifis now i uh, you know they do provide not just grants but a blend of uh, you know depending on the income level uh, the poorest countries tend to get more grant type flows but it's more concessional financing that uh, that uh, they provide um, OECD countries uh, aid uh, in you know in most cases has moved to grant form wherever feasible or concessional uh, highly concessional forms so uh, I think going forward some of the discussion that's going to have to take place is all the terms of the financing that the region gets from other creditors also uh, you know the, the, the we often narrow, you know, go directly to China, but it's not just China that's a provider of non-concessional financing to the region, but a whole host of other uh, other um, entities also. Global financial markets, I think by far the biggest right. share of um, flows uh, uh, are from, you know, uh, private sources, which are all non-concessional. And that's often hidden because we don't count... Um, we don't count the investments that uh, uh, you know uh, investors make in domestic markets in those countries also, which are also non-concessional. So that's by far a bigger share than uh, than uh, resources from China. But the terms of this financing is something that's going to have to be looked at. Um, and from the country side, of course, you know they need to have more diversified forms of financing, uh, different sources, but always with an eye to make you know using the resources for as. Uh, as productive investments as possible, as we were saying earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, just to just basically to add to that, that it, there is indeed we are seeing indeed uh, a, a stronger momentum within the continent to to combat those illicit outflows and even uh, try to bring back some of that already left the continent. I think uh, Abi and I were actually at the uh, uh, at the G20 summit on Africa in Berlin over the summer, and then the when the president of Ghana took the stage. He basically called for really uh, combating illicit flows, and the whole room really erupted in applause. That just shows how how ready they are to take actions. And I've also been seeing um, concrete actions, actually attempts on the continent. I think it was just last week when a, a, a number of countries convened in Abuja to precisely help share best practices and strategies to to combat illicit uh, illicit flows. And uh, some governments, like uh, uh, that of Angola, has put out 
a, a, a law through Parliament that is going to encourage the repatriation of funds that have already left. And I think there's a certain limit under below which if you bring your funds back, it will be like no questions asked, no, task, uh, no tax on them, etc. So we are seeing increasingly those, uh, those, those efforts. And uh, um, I'm pretty hopeful that uh, uh, that along with really concerted efforts from uh, Africa's partners as well, because as someone said, it takes two to tango. And uh, uh, maybe some places where we're seeing those funds uh, find safe havens, we can get cooperation uh, from those countries as well to help uh, prevent them coming in and uh, perhaps help, so help also repatriate, uh, repatriate the, the funds. And there's a role in it too for think civil society, members of civil society to put more pressure on it and then to bring more visibility to the issue. And do you have any thoughts on Hank's second point about China and how, how they can move to more concessional or, or grants? Um, how China can move to more concessional grant? Uh, I would say I don't have a, a really good answer <laughs> to that. Uh, in fact, I don't have a good answer how to make China do anything <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't want to do. <laughs> I must say, I, I, I would think sort of, you know, more, more blended financing, mm -hmm. sort of Western and, and, and Chinese, if we could get more cooperation in those projects, that might give more scope for mm -hmm. more, more generous terms, but to be determined. I think we have time for one more question. Landry. Landry Signé, uh, a member of, it, of uh, cool team at uh, the Africa Golf Initiative. Uh, my question is to uh, Abibi. So we have been speaking about domestic resource mobilization. It's quite a la mode. So what, what is new in your approach? How do you collaborate to make it become a reality? Thank you. You know, um <laughs> Uh, of course, there's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> and uh, um, in a way, uh, capturing the rate of return on on uh, investments that governments make has been really uh, the seminal challenge. Uh, the seminal challenge for de all developing countries, right, as they're going through this phase. So. Um, the reason why we are emphasizing it so much right now is exactly because we see uh, death vulnerabilities increasing in the region. Um, and but at the same time, the, the spending needs, the development needs of countries remaining very, very large. And uh, to us, at least, that's the only way we can see that you can square the circle is by, by um, uh, mobilizing uh, more, uh, more revenues. Another reason, perhaps, is that, you know, if you if you look at um, uh, the data the way you know you guys have also done, uh, you do see uh, that there's a lot of money being left on the table, as it were. Uh, there's a lot of potential which is not being exploited. Uh, um, so I think uh, in in many cases uh, tax tax uh, legislation, but also tax administration systems. Do not quite are not as nimble as economic uh, the economies in our region are. Eh? Um, if you look at you know last time I was in Lagos was several you know three four years ago and what struck me was uh, how large the service sector was. Um, but uh, you know I'm not sure how well taxed that sector is and you know my sense would be that the focus still is on going after the manufacturing sector. Um, so I, you know the structure of African economies is incredibly dynamic. It changes uh, you know from year to year to year, and tax systems have to have to um, adjust to these new uh, sources of uh, of uh, economic activity. Uh, and making sure that you know tax to GDP ratios are increasing uh, over time, uh, both keeping pace with the economy, but really also, uh, uh, you know, uh, going up uh, is going to be critical to be able to avoid uh, either a debt problem or, to, you know, uh, conversely or relatedly to to be able to continue to provide much needed health, education, infrastructure services. So uh, that's why it's salient now and. Um, you know, uh, w w there's a strong need for policymakers to focus on it. Any final thoughts, Cole? Um, no, I think the um, it's also sometimes, uh, even if it's been 
uh, tackled in the past uh, to to take a, a look back to sort of see what has changed. And I think one thing the report quite uh, highlights well is that we have been been seeing been seeing some increases in uh, in tax mobilization and revenue mobilization. And uh, um, and then we're able then to draw more lessons as to what were the factors that were contributing to to the extent that they can help inform what can be done to further boost it and uh, in, in the, the direction that we want it to go. So I think we've had a f comprehensive discussion. Um, for me, it's been quite interesting, and I sort of leave here, you know, feeling more than cautiously optimistic. Africa is projected to grow at 3.6 percent this year headed toward 3.8 and 4 percent next year. I think that's quite encouraging. The, the conversation that we've had on uh, domestic uh, resource mobilization I think is quite important to keep at the center and of course the whole issue of private investment and how we how we get more private investment into the uh, in, into Africa and various economies. <laughs> but keeping in mind as you say Abby, you know Africa's 54 countries and each country has its own set of policy challenges and policy opportunities, and it's not one size right. that fits all. So we'll keep our focus set for your report next year and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank Please you. join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.